All right, hello, <clears throat> excuse me, and welcome to the temporary online Logan Community Writing Center. We were also sad when we learned that we wouldn't be able to meet for a while in person, so major shout out to Jack for vouching that we move online for the time being. I believe that writing communities and just communities interaction are so important to us right now. So thank you for taking the time to quote unquote be with us today. My name is Emily Joy and I'm so excited to be talking about how to uh, fall in love with writing again. I think this might be something that we all need right now, just a little bit of push towards creativity, something to do at home. So I thought I'd just start off by giving you a little bit of background. This is a picture of me, if you're joining us for the first time, uh, or if you've been coming for a while and just don't know what I look like. I am pretty new. I've only been working at the Writing Center for a couple of months now. I am actually an English education major, so I'm a bit more used to analyzing creative writing rather than actually doing creative writing myself. Although I've recently been taking a few creative writing courses at Utah State and I've absolutely loved them. I feel that creative writing is incredibly important in the classroom, especially in high school and middle school. And as I've been in the classroom doing observations and little student teaching, I am seeing more and more that students don't like writing. They will mention how they hate it, they feel uncomfortable, it's hard, they're just not good at it. And that is so sad, but I think a lot of people go through similar phases where for some reason we just don't want to write. It can be a lot of effort getting our thoughts and ideas out on paper or online. So today I hope to introduce you to some fun writing prompts and activities just to get your brain going. And this can function sort of like a workshop, so after I explain each activity, please feel free to pause the video and take some time to practice your own writing skills. So, without further ado, we are going to jump right in. Let's start by just quickly going over what might stop us from loving the writing process. And I actually think that that's part of it right there. It's a process and it takes a lot of time and effort to get really good at writing, or sometimes just even to get the results that we want. And that can be really frustrating. That can, that can stop a lot of people right in their tracks. These are just a couple of reasons why I could think of why we might stop writing. It can, it can be incredibly frustrating when you just sit there for a few hours or days, sometimes even months, and just can't seem to get anywhere with a piece of writing. That can be caused because of burnout, Maybe you've just been working so much that writing is just one more thing. I know a lot of college students feel that way. We write so much that why would we want to write for fun in our, in our free time? Sometimes we get stuck and we don't know exactly what to write next, what scene, what character, what plot point might be good. We can experience writer's block, which is just inability to create. And that can, as mentioned before, that can last a long time. I think it can be very frustrating and, and it feels like it's debilitating. Sometimes we just wait for inspiration to come to us. So we're not willing to necessarily put in the work, but we want those beautiful aha writer's moments that we see um, so much in movies or read about in books. And sometimes we just want it to be perfect or not even perfect. We just want it to be really good the first time. I put unwillingness to wrestle with the process and sometimes the thought of editing and revision and all putting your vulnerability out there like it's just a lot and we want it to be good the first time so we don't have to have uh, so we don't have to deal with those I despite how frustrating it can be um I found this really great quote by Julia Kostorf who's the director of Penn State's Master of Fine Arts program in creative writing and she says we are not machines right now just because there aren't leaves on the tree doesn't mean the trees are dead or broken. And I feel like that's very appropriate uh, with spring so close. I don't know about you all, but in uh, my neighborhood right now, there's a lot of trees with buds coming out just barely. And sometimes that's us. Sometimes we just get burned out. We can't just go, 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 go all the time as writers and as artists and as creators. And sometimes a little work needs to be done under the surface before we have major breakthroughs. So in that time where we're maybe hibernating or we've got some 
some underneath the neath work going on, here are some fun, hopefully fun activities that you can do to just kind of keep you going. So the first one is free writing or a writing marathon. Now free writing is a pretty popular activity um, among teachers. We use it a lot to get students to just put words on a page. Sometimes that's the hardest part is just staring at a blank page. And so the uh, idea behind free writing is you set a time for, or you set a timer for a certain amount of time. That could be three minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever you like. I usually recommend starting with three to five minutes if you've never done free writing before. Uh, but the point is to keep writing the entire time. That means the pen or the pencil does not leave the paper. And that can be stressful, but don't worry about creating a story or having it even make sense. Don't worry about spelling, punctuation, or grammar. And I know that can be really hard, but just focus on writing the entire time, whatever comes to your mind. With that being said, don't be afraid about saying the hard stuff. It's a free write and nobody needs to see it but you. Write whatever comes to your mind. Writing marathons are kind of new-ish. Uh, the first one was started in 1994 in New Orleans and it draws on a book by Natalie Goldsberg. By Natalie Goldsberg, it's called Writing Down to the Bones and a text by Ernest Hemingway. So the basic idea is you start by getting a group together and creating a writing schedule. And the purpose is to go out into the community and find places to write in 10 to 30 minute increments. So as a group, you can travel together to these set places for the amount of time, or you can travel as individuals. The main point is you want to be able to meet up in between sessions or all together at the end and share what you've written. This is the kicker with no commentary from anybody else. It sounds cheesy, but when you get together to share your writing, each person starts by saying, I am a writer. And afterwards they share their writing and there's no feedback. No great job, I liked it, or you could work on this. You just directly move on to the next person. And the purpose of this was for writers to get out into their communities and be inspired by what was around them. And then to feel free to share their writing in an environment where they knew there would be no feedback whatsoever. So it's supposed to be a very freeing exercise. Um, and it's just kind of fun. Obviously right now, <laughs> don't meet in groups. Don't go out like in groups and such, but you could do it by yourself in your house. You could go outside or there are even virtual writing marathon groups that you can join. Um, you can find a group online, uh, and I've actually put links to those at the end of the presentation, so hopefully we can get those to you. So that's free writing and writing marathons. So go ahead and pause this video if you'd like, and you can take three to five minutes and just practice free writing. Okay, so moving on from free writing and writing marathons, pictures and art. I This is one of my favorites. We cannot participate in the beautiful art of people watching right now. However, that does not mean that we can find interesting moments and people write in our very own homes. I love this particular website called Unsplash for all sorts of reasons, but it has beautiful free photos anyone can use. If you just type in the search box people, all sorts of incredible photos pop up. All of these photos on this slide were from that search. Um, and it's kind of fun to just choose one that piques your interest and start writing about them. You know, what is this person thinking? How did they get to that particular place? What are they in the middle of saying? Or are they going to say something to the person right behind the camera? Have they just moved to a new city? Why are they smiling or frowning? This is really a wonderful chance to give life to your photo. I was first introduced to this activity in a teaching writing course that I was in. And we did what was called a gallery walk. So there was a bunch of these types of photos pasted up along the walls and we would walk around to this, there's like quiet music playing and we would um, just kind of write about the people. And there was a timer. So if you'd like, you can set a timer for that as well. Um, just kind of fun to look at people and, and be inspired by others' lives. So going along with photos, let's also talk about some art. 
There's lots of museums right now that are prompting and promoting free virtual tours, so why not take advantage of that, right? This particular painting is from 1470, titled St. George and the Dragon, and it depicts a scene from the famous tale of St. George, who is the patron saint of England. It also serves as inspiration for a very fun poem written by U.A. Fanthorpe. So I just wanted to take a minute and I'm going to read that to you as this painting's up on the screen. And it's titled, Not My Best Side. While I read this poem, see if you can figure out which perspective uh, or which character is talking, like whose perspective we're, we're listening to this. And just think about how art and looking at other perspectives can kind of inspire new and creative writing. So I'm, this is part one of a three-part poem. And you can read the whole thing in the hyperlink that I've provided at the end of the slide. So part one, not my best side. <clears throat> not my best side, I'm afraid. The artist didn't give me a chance to pose properly, as you can see, poor chap. He had this obsession with triangles, so he left off two of my feet. I didn't comment at it. I, I didn't comment at the time. What, after all, are two feet to a monster? But afterwards, I was sorry for the bad publicity. Why, I said to myself, should my conqueror be so ostentatiously beardless and ride a horse with a deformed neck and square hoofs? Why should my victim be so unattractive as to be inedible? And why should she have me literally on a string? I don't mind dying, ritually, since I always rise again. But I should have liked a little more blood to show they were... They, they were taking me seriously. So that's a fun little section of the poem uh, from the perspective of the dragon. Um, and, and so that's just two of three parts. It's great. You can look it up. But how fun is that? Being able to take a piece of art and kind of make up a story for one of the characters. So on this next slide, I've, I've got a couple of really famous paintings. You've probably seen them. And take a minute here. You can pause the video again and just practice writing from the perspective of one of the characters that you see painted. Or you can go ahead and visit Unsplash and see what people and stories you can bring to life on your own. So just a quick mental break for those of you who are writing along with us today. This is a quote by one of my fam favorite authors, Ursula K. Le Guin. And she says, resistance and change often begin in art very often in the art of words. I think that's beautiful. I think it's wonderful to pull inspiration from our favorite authors. From Sometimes it's just nice to read quotes to kind of get you in the writing mood. So we've talked about free writing. We've talked about pictures and art. You can always try poetry. And I know that it can be intimidating for a lot of people, but hopefully I've pulled together just a couple of ideas that will make it seem slightly more approachable. Okay, so we've got blackout and copycat poetry. So the first one is blackout poetry. And just as uh, the title is, it's where you literally black out words on a page. This could be a page of a book, a magazine. You could print off an online article. I personally like to begin by circling words that I find interesting, short phrases. Um, I usually do that in pencil. And then I'll go back through and, and try and to, try to create a, um, I want to say like a vibe. <laughs> Blackout poetry doesn't always make the most sense. Um, but, but it's a really fun exercise in what I like to think of as recycling words. I think it's beautiful to take something that someone else has written and create your own out of it. So... Find words that you think are interesting, phrases, circle them, and then you literally take a marker or a pen and black out the rest of the words on the page. As the picture shows at the bottom of the slide, you could literally black out the lines or as in the top right hand corner, kind of create interesting designs and mix it up a little bit if you feel like really getting creative. So that is blackout poetry. Another one of my favorites is copycat poetry. Copy, sorry, copycat poetry. There we go. Uh, sometimes I feel that other people just say it better. And I once had a professor who talked about how there's no thing as stealing per se. There's just creative theft. And I think that it's safe to say we've all read work that's inspired us one way or another. 
And right now at this time, what is wrong with copying styles, phrasing, structure, themes? We're not setting out to publish other authors' work under our own names, but sometimes it's good to practice just copying other types of styles, maybe styles that you're not as comfortable with, just giving you a good place to start. So I've got an example here of a poem that I really enjoy called A to Z, American Born Chinese by Sophia. I believe her last name is pronounced Hung. And so this is her poem on the left-hand side. And she says, I remember when I first learned my ABCs. A is for apple, B is for bird, and C is for cat. But further experience taught me that ABC means American-born Chinese. A is for adjectives, words that describe nouns, words that are used to divide and separate. It goes on, it's a beautiful poem, and she takes each letter of the alphabet and talks about how it kind of applies to her situation as a, an American Chinese citizen. I, for an assignment, kind of did a copycat poem. And so mine is on the right hand side. It says, I remember first learning my ABCs. A is for ant, B is for bear, and C is for cookie. But I learned later that ABC stands for Air Force, Band-Aids, and Curly Hair. And so then I go on and, and I kind of copied the same pattern. So it's just kind of taking basic ideas, making it your own, Again, I think it's kind of fun to, to see how, to, to be inspired by other people's styles and themes and, and thoughts. So on this next slide, I've got just a portion of Robert Frost's poem, The Road Not Taken. And go ahead, see, you can pause the video and see if you can do a copycat poem based off of the structure, the themes, the, um, the way that he uses his words. Okay, so moving on. This is actually, this one's probably my favorite, is sensory writing. I love <laughs> good smells. I love candles. I love oranges. I love the smell of fresh laundry. It just makes me so happy. And it's so cool to see how our senses can really assist us in the writing process. Smells, tastes, sounds, they can all bring back memories or specific thoughts or even themes. They are incredibly powerful. I was in my teaching writing class one day and some of my friends were teaching part of class. They handed out slips of paper that had been soaked in lemon juice and they had us smell the paper and then write a poem inspired by the smell. And then we wrote a piece of nonfiction and then we wrote a small piece of fiction all just based off of the scent of lemons on the paper. And I loved it. It was so interesting and cool to see how for my nonfiction piece, the scent of lemon all of a sudden brought back all of these times where I had learned about house cleaning from my mom. And, and it was just so cool to, to see how lemons and that smell had triggered that thought and brought forth actually a really cool piece that I ended up really loving. So this, what I have here on the side is a similar activity taken from an English teacher who I believe is at Green Canyon High School right now. And it's called Orange You Sensing It, and it's focusing on teaching sensory imagery. But I found it to be a really great practice in um, taking a break from normal writing patterns. The basic concept is uh, this teacher will pass out an orange to every student and then they have this worksheet with these questions on it that they just kind of fill in on their own. So you can do this on your own with an orange or an apple or possibly a banana, whatever you've got uh, lying around your house would be wonderful. So. Take a look at the orange and what does it look like? Use a simile or metaphor to describe the texture or the feel. Use a simile or metaphor to describe the action of slicing into the skin. Use a simile or metaphor to describe the sound of the orange being peeled. Describe the smell of the orange. Use two to five sentences to describe the inside of the orange. And then finally, take a bite and use a simile or a metaphor to describe the taste of an orange. Sensory details enhance any type of writing. They make it more interesting and engaging to the reader. I think right now, especially, is it's a wonderful time to slow down and stop and admire something as beautiful as the sensory details of an orange. Um, 
So that's, that's one of my favorite little writing activities. Hopefully you've found something that you've liked. If not, here are some additional resources I personally like to use when I'm looking for inspiration or assistance in the writing process. Starting with the lower left-hand corner, we have Pinterest. Pinterest is pretty popular, so you might have heard of it. It's a really wonderful search engine that I use to find anything from new recipes to lesson plans. You could search for writing challenges. They have lots of like 30 day writing challenges and such. They have wonderful examples of beautiful blackout poetry. One of my favorite things to do is I just type writing prompts and really funny prompts pop up that you can just finish, take like a minute or two, write in a journal. One of my favorites that popped up the other day was um, the narrator was running late and just showed up to a story already in progress. He doesn't know who the villains, are, who the heroes are, or the villains, or even what genre this is. I just love it. Like, just something kind of fun, something different. Uh, up at the top, Little Infinite Poetry is a website and an Instagram account. They share little bits of poetry from their followers, and they also have a lot of just small contests you can enter, which is kind of fun. They actually have one going on right now since it's National Poetry Month. You can go to their website and enter and they'll have like little prizes like gift cards and such. So that's kind of a fun place that I like to find inspiration. Um, Poetry Foundation right there in the middle is also a website and an Instagram account. Their website contains it's a giant poetry database, but their Instagram account occasionally they'll post just beautiful poetry that always really seems to brighten up my day. Bottom right hand corner, there's a website called Grub Street. I didn't really know about Grub Street, but it is a nonprofit cre uh, creative writing center located in Boston. They have various workshops, seminars, events, and programs all online to support writers at different stages of their development. It's actually a really cool website. I would really recommend checking it out. And right above that, there's just a list of some really fantastic literary Instagram accounts. If you have an Instagram, some of them offer nice book reviews. Some of them like the top folded pages distillery. Um, just have really pretty pictures of books <laughs> that just make me happy. Um, it just puts me more in a writer kind of a mood, I guess. There's a ton of more places that you can find online. Um, you can get writing prompts, writing inspiration. These are just a couple that I personally really enjoy. I just wanted to end by, of course, giving credit where credit is due. And these resources down here at the bottom are hyperlinks. So I will see if we can get those in the notes or something. If you are really curious about the history of writing marathons or want to host your own writing marathon or want to go visit that poem later on, whatever you want. So I'll see if I can get those to you. And then just wanted to end by saying thank you so much for being willing to join us online for a community writing center presentation. That means a lot to us at this time. Um, and just ending with a wonderful quote by William Faulkner, don't be a writer, be writing. So hopefully you can take some of this time that we're all separated and maybe kind of lonely to produce something beautiful that you can really be proud of. Um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us and we will hopefully see you soon.